Winfield Scott Hancock and his family left Los Angeles in August 1861, traveled through the Isthmus of Panama and then on to New York, where they took a train to Washington, then to Louisville, Kentucky, where he had been assigned to General Robert Anderson's staff, the defender of Fort Sumter, as his quartermaster. Hancock was at risk of being stuck in the same position as he had been during the Mexican War in the quartermaster department, barely getting out in time to see action. His ability and reliability as a quartermaster was hurting him again, but Hancock had been training and preparing for war since his days in Mexico. While at Jefferson Barracks in peacetime, he had been the protege of General William Harney, a rough Tennessean who Hancock learned to wield profanity from. Winfield had also been immersing himself in military studies, looking into the campaigns of Caesar, Napoleon, Wellington, and Frederick the Great. Some historians have highlighted Hancock as one of the most prepared officers to take field command during the Civil War. Thankfully for the Pennsylvanian, he was sent to Washington, D.C., where George B. McClellan was organizing the army. Both men had gotten to know one another at West Point and in Mexico, and after a several-hour interview with McClellan, Hancock waited in the capital until a position within the army could be procured. On September 23rd, he was appointed to a brigadier general in the division of William F. Smith. Hancock could breathe easy now that he knew he wouldn't be stuck in the quartermaster department. His brigade was made up of the 5th Wisconsin, 43rd New York, and 47th and 49th Pennsylvania. However, the 47th would soon be transferred and the 6th Maine would take its place. Unlike many of the political appointees that outranked Hancock, Winfield knew what combat entailed, so he wasted no time in instituting stern discipline within his ranks, knowing that battles could be won or lost dependent on the ability of troops to obey commands. Although he was a tough commander, his men grew to respect him and trust him with their lives. One way that Hancock enforced discipline was through what one historian called one of the most colored and sulfuric vocabulary in the whole army. He had learned this ability from his old mentor, Harney, and Hancock's troops would recall fondly specific eruptions of swear words. It was not all training, but social gatherings popped up all over Washington, D.C. Most of Hancock's friends, who he had spent time with in the capital in the past, were now on the side of the Confederacy, particularly Johnston and Davis. Hancock's democratic leanings made him keep quiet about his political views in case it might impact his military standing but he never was one to flaunt his politics in the first place. He was discreet for the most part. Almira and the children rented a house in Washington to be close to Winfield, especially because once campaign started, Hancock knew that they would see less of each other. The couple were invited to a soiree at the White House where only cabinet members, senators, diplomats, and major generals of the army were invited. Hancock and his wife were the only exception to the guest list, him only being a brigadier general. First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln informed Almira that her and her family had showed great hospitality to the Todd family on their trips to St. Louis in the past, and this was a way of reciprocating. In the spring of 1862, McClellan had won approval for the Peninsula Campaign, and on March 23rd, Hancock embarked for Alexandria and wrote to his wife that, I am off at last, and it is a matter of great pain to me that I am unable to see you again before we part. God alone knows for how long. I rode all last night, and while I rode, I did not cease to think of how and where all this unhappiness is to end. By April, the Union Army had arrived at Fort Monroe on the peninsula and began their march toward Richmond, but heavy rain bogged down the army. At the Siege of Yorktown that incredibly lasted a month, Hancock and his brigade skirmished with the other side but did nothing substantial to single himself out as anything spectacular. In May, at the Battle of Williamsburg, he got the opportunity to display his effectiveness at command. Joseph Hooker's division attacked Fort Magruder, while Hancock's superiors sent Winfield with five regiments to the far right of the Union line in order to occupy a supposedly abandoned redoubt at Fort Magruder. He was accompanied by a young officer on William F. Smith's staff named George Armstrong Custer. After crossing Cub Dam Creek, Hancock took the abandoned redoubt and informed his commander that another apparently abandoned redoubt was about 1,200 yards ahead of his position. Smith informed Hancock that reinforcements would be sent immediately and to take it. Winfield did as he was told, and upon taking the position, realized that from that vantage point, he could see the entire Confederate line and their entire allocation of troops. Ahead of his men was another fortified position, this time with enemy troops within them. Hancock called up his artillery and delivered a withering fire into the Confederates who pulled back. 
Winfield wanted to take that advanced position, but the reinforcements had not made it to the advanced line that he occupied. In fact, Smith sent him a message that he was unable to send the reinforcements and to pull back to his first position. Hancock was irate at the order. Custer observed firsthand the string of expletives that the Pennsylvanian could spew forth when the order reached him. Hancock sent an engineer officer with detailed information to Smith about how critical it was for the brigade to keep the advanced position for the integrity of the entire army's position. Winfield stated in his response that if no response was made in a reasonable amount of time that he would follow orders. He was walking a fine line of insubordination, but he did not want to give up such a strategic advantage. After an hour of waiting, he was about to pull back his brigade, but at that moment, Confederate infantry began approaching his brigade. This was a critical moment for Hancock. If he failed to repel the attack after already being ordered to withdraw, his career could be over through the extreme damage of reputation. The Confederates opposing him were two Virginia regiments led by Jubal Early and two North Carolina regiments led by Daniel Harvey Hill. Hancock feigned a retreat by pulling his men up a hill, but once the enemy got within range, his brigade let loose two volleys. Then he rode up and down his line yelling, Gentlemen, charge with the bayonet! On the order, the blue troops raced down the hill, puncturing many frontline enemy troops and sending them to the rear. With Hancock's presence on the extreme left of the Confederate line, Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston, although already planning to fall back, was forced to by the actions of Hancock. His possible insubordination was forgotten, and McClellan wired the Secretary of War describing Winfield's actions as superb, and the name stuck. Hancock the Superb would be seen in newspapers all over the North. McClellan's army pressed on to Richmond, where Johnston was wounded and replaced by Robert E. Lee. The successive battles are known as the Seven Days Campaign. At Gaines Mill, Hancock's brigade was tested once again, this time being attacked by and repulsing Robert Toombs Brigade, inflicting heavy casualties on the Georgians' men. The Union Army pulled back after each Confederate attack, and at White Oak Swamp, Hancock's men withstood a heavy barrage of artillery from Stonewall Jackson's troops and repulsed a half-hearted attempt by the Confederate general who judged the location too difficult to cross and simply went to sleep under a tree. The rest of the campaign saw little to no action for Hancock's men. His total casualties for the Seven Days Campaign was about 200 men, small compared to other embattled units. However, his ambition and standout performance at Williamsburg and Gaines Mill put him ahead in reputation among the Army of the Potomac. McClellan and his army moved back down the peninsula and waited for orders to return to Northern Virginia in Washington, D.C. Hancock and his men remained at Fort Monroe until transports could be sent them to aid General Pope's Army of Virginia, but by the time that the corps in which Hancock was in made it to Northern Virginia, a series of miscommunication and lack of cooperation made him miss the Battle of Second Manassas. However, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia was now moving into Maryland and the Union Army, again under George McClellan, would pursue the invading rebels. The 6th Corps commander, William B. Franklin, could be just as slow as McClellan at attacking the enemy. Therefore, although an opportunity to strike at the rebels after crossing Crampton's Gap was clear, the Corps commander refused to commit any of his brigades, including Hancock's. The two armies collided at a little town called Sharpsburg on the Antietam Creek that fed into the Potomac River, and Hancock sat relatively unused during the entire battle, that is, until fate thrust him into a new position. General Israel B. Richardson and his division of the 2nd Corps had launched numerous assaults against the Bloody Lane. While he was doing this, a shell fragment from an artillery barrage hit him and he had to be carried from the field. He would die two months later from complications from the wounding, including infection. McClellan, knowing the capability of Hancock, ordered him to take command of Richardson's division. It took him a while to place his brigade under its new successor and make it to the location of Richardson's division, but when he arrived, McClellan ordered him to dig in and repel any attack made against his line. The division withstood a withering barrage of artillery while they waited for a possible attack, but other than a small Confederate contingent making an appearance on his left, but was driven away by artillery, Hancock and his new command waited through the night and into the next day, and ordered not to engage in hostilities. Lee's army retreated from the outskirts of Sharpsburg, and McClellan stayed put. A month later, he ordered Hancock and his division to cross the Potomac River at Harper's Ferry and reconnoiter the ground. Winfield pressed as far as Charlestown, drove away its light rebel defenders, and occupied the city. 
McClellan journeyed to the town in person to talk with Hancock and after the discussion became satisfied that no Confederate attack would be forthcoming and pulled back the division. On November 5, 1862, Lincoln removed McClellan as commander of the Army of the Potomac and replaced him with Ambrose Burnside. Hancock was good friends with McClellan. It had been Little Mac who had gotten him an infantry command and installed him as a division commander. But he also saw the missed opportunity in letting Lee's army return across the Potomac and to sit idle on September 18th. He made the comment to those grumbling in the army, We are serving no one man. We are serving our country. Now at the head of a division, Hancock performed his duties masterfully as always. An aide in great detail described the 38-year-old officer. He was tall, with straight hair, now a light brown, a mustache and a tuft on his chin of the same color, well-cut features, a firm jaw, and deep blue eyes. He was always neatly dressed, and one of the wonders of the Army of the Potomac was the fact that Hancock always wore a clean white shirt, well-pressed, even in the midst of a long march or a protracted battle. His years in the quartermaster department prepared him for the mountains of paperwork and correspondence necessary to be a division commander, and he was meticulous toward proper procedure. Even the smallest detail came under scrutiny of Hancock toward his subordinates, but as they said, he would never inflate the small details at the expense of larger ones. Hancock always wanted to know what was going on within his division, and in this respect we see why his men loved him so much. He took the time and care to know the names of his subordinates. He met with them as often as he could, getting to know them and their demeanor. These actions would pay dividends for the division commander when large battles erupted and he was expected to order certain brigades and regiments into a fight. He needed to know who was the best commander for certain situations. Hancock always played the long game when it came to his actions and behavior. One thing he liked to do was to woo newspaper reporters. He loved having them in camp. This action can be seen as twofold. One, he wanted him and his command to be portrayed in the best light when northern newspapers were constantly criticizing the Army of the Potomac. And two, having prominent leaders and commands featured in stories could boost the morale of not only the Army, but the nation. At one point later in the war, a newspaper writer did his command injustice with a story, and he even called for the arrest of the reporter. However, he even made reporters members of his staff or gave them positions within his command if they seemed to possess the qualities that he deemed necessary for achieving victory, and he was correct in his estimations. The men he gave those commissions to performed admirably in battle and contributed positively to the Union war effort. Soon after the Battle of Antietam, Abraham Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation. Hancock's political beliefs did not like the idea of the federal government interfering in the domestic institutions of the South, but again, when he looked around, secession and the Confederacy had called into question the Constitution itself. He understood that this would not be a short war and that extra constitutional means may be involved to suppress the rebellion. He did not like it, but he was willing to do what it took to preserve the Union. General Burnside marched his army to the Rappahannock River across from the town of Fredericksburg. There he waited for pontoon bridges to arrive in order to cross. It looked as though Burnside had outmaneuvered Robert E. Lee. Beyond the town lay a series of heights known as Mary's Heights, and before pontoon bridges could make it to Burnside, Lee began occupying those areas and digging in where necessary. The Union Army commander was still determined to attack Lee there. Edwin Sumner, prior to the fighting, called together all of his division and brigade commanders, which included Hancock. Sumner vouched for Burnside and attempted to describe how the attack could work out in the Union's favor. Darius Couch and Winfield Hancock spoke up at this meeting and described how disastrous the attacks could be. Later, Burnside heard about this meeting and called together the same group of men, where he singled out Hancock. The division commander reinforced his belief that attacking the well-entrenched enemy would not end well for the federal forces. Burnside stated that the plan would work, and all he asked was for the loyal obedience to his orders. November 29, 1862, Hancock became a Major General of Volunteers. The very next day, he acquired the rank of Major in the Quartermaster Corps. Although the Major's rank meant little at the time, when the war was over and the wartime armies diminished, that rank would help his standing in the post-war army. It was Hancock's men who would help support the engineers assembling the pontoons across the river. The 66th and 57th New York regiments attempted to support the engineers from the riverbank, 
but ended up crossing the river to rid the opposite side of Confederate sharpshooters, wreaking havoc on the poor engineers. The two regiments lost 150 men killed and wounded before the pontoon bridge was completed on December 11th. Once across, Hancock's division was the second division to attack the entrenched Confederates under General James Longstreet on the rebel left flank. French's division went in first, then behind them was Hancock. Winfield sent Zook's brigade first, then the Irish brigade, then finally Caldwell's men, but none of them could budge the Confederate line. The blue troops had to cross a canal, then weather the withering artillery fire across hundreds of yards in open terrain. Then within rifle fire, the Confederate infantry let loose volley after volley. By the end of the day, of around 5,000 men that Hancock sent into battle, 2,000 were casualties. Over the next day or so, the division recrossed the river, defeated. Years after the war, a Confederate infantryman who had defended Mary's Heights against Hancock heard someone proclaim that Pickett's men during Pickett's charge was the most heroic charge ever made. The old veteran replied by saying, I was with Lee's army from the beginning and surrendered at Appomattox, and I never saw anything that surpassed the charge made by Hancock and Humphreys at Fredericksburg. After the debacle at Fredericksburg, Hancock would get a leave of absence to go visit his wife and children in St. Louis. Therefore, he missed out on Burnside's mud march. He would rejoin his command in the spring of 1863 and diligently went back to work preparing his men for upcoming engagements. Hancock loved for his troops to drill on the division's parade ground. He also took great pleasure in streaming together cuss words at his brigade commanders if a mistake was made during the drill. General Samuel K. Zook became the focus of the division commander's rants, more so from playful bantering because Zook had no problem throwing the swear words back at his commander, and the two grew closer through their little squabbles on the parade ground. In early 1863, Abraham Lincoln changed commanders, this time to General Joseph Hooker. Hooker was a meticulous organizer, which helped place the army in better standing. For instance, he revamped the leave system, which allowed the individual soldiers to know when their leave of absence would be. This ultimately decreased desertions, since the troops knew when to expect a break and to see their family and rest. He also implemented the insignias for the different corps. Hooker did a lot of good for the army, and in April he launched his advance against Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. The Southerners occupied Fredericksburg, so Hooker split his army, leaving three corps to guard the Rappahannock near that town, and the rest of the army would move across the river and the Rapidan at multiple locations. Once on the other side, Hooker's men would march east and trap Lee and his army between two halves of the army. At least that was the plan. It was a good plan. He even took Lee by surprise, who had already divided his force by sending General Longstreet and some of his troops south. Lee was now outnumbered, and the Union army was now taking advantage. The aggressiveness of Hooker was paying off. The Union Corps moved through the dense forested area known as the Wilderness and emerged from it on the River Road, the Turnpike, and the Plank Road. But by this point, Lee was aware that Hooker was on the move, and again split his force, leaving around 10,000 men to guard Fredericksburg, while the rest marched west to confront Hooker. General Sykes' men first encountered Lafayette McClaw's men along the Turnpike. The tough resistance destroyed the confidence of Hooker, and he ordered all of his corps to pull back to the Wilderness and the Chancellorsville area, choosing to remain in the difficult terrain that made his numbers negligible compared to the open ground just to the east. Hancock and his corps commander, General Couch, pleaded along with others to press on, but there was no change in Hooker's decision. The aggressiveness had faded, and now he was on the defensive. Hancock's men dug in at the center of the Union line near the community of Chancellorsville. Lee's bluff had worked, and he and his right-hand man, General Stonewall Jackson, hatched a bold plan. Since Hooker was not going to move, this provided an opportunity to strike the Union Army's right flank, guarded by the 11th Corps under Oliver Otis Howard. Jackson moved three divisions around the Union Army and launched that assault. At about 5 p.m. on May 2nd, the Confederates launched their assault on the Union right flank. As it crumbled, McClaws launched his own attacks against Hancock's division. The Pennsylvanian held out after multiple attacks by the Southerners. To make things worse for the Union Army, Hooker, at his headquarters at the Chancellorsville Mansion, got hit in the head and back by a fallen pillar struck by an artillery shell. He was dazed the rest of the fight, but thoroughly convinced he was surrounded and outnumbered. 
when in reality much of his line was holding firm, especially the Second Corps. Intimidated by the heavy assaults against his line, Hooker assembled some defenses but ultimately ordered for the withdrawal of his forces back across the Rapidan and Rappahannock rivers. However, the Southerners were still pressing in on the Union defenders. At one point, Winfield was fighting a foe in front of his position and behind his position as he guarded the roads to the fords. General Jeb Stuart had taken over for Jackson after the wounding of Stonewall, and the young cavalier was pushing hard against the Union line, but Hancock doggedly held on for dear life, directing his troops from horseback. As cannonballs and bullets whizzed by him, he never flinched. He was focused on allocating his troops where they were needed. Finally, Hancock was able to safely get his men across the rivers and be known as the saviors of the Union Army. After the military disaster that was the Battle of Chancellorsville, the Army of the Potomac went through drastic changes. For one, Darius Couch, the commander of the 2nd Corps, became so disgusted by the actions or lack of action by Army Commander Joseph Hooker that he requested reassignment, which he received. Hancock was the natural choice for Couch's position, but his rise to Corps command would come about during a tumultuous time. Abraham Lincoln and other commanders were irritated at Hooker's actions, so the tensions within the Army was immense. But Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia were on the move, causing more problems for the Federals. Due to Jeb Stuart's screening movements, all Hooker knew was that the Confederate Army was moving, but had no idea where. Slowly, the Blue Troops began moving north, chasing after the Rebels. It was during this pursuit that Lincoln relieved Hooker of command, an action that took Hooker by surprise since a large battle was imminent. The President had searched for a replacement. One of his first choices was John Reynolds, commander of the 1st Corps, but he wanted to be assured that he wouldn't be drawn into political infighting in Washington, D.C. Finally, Lincoln settled on George Meade, but there were rumors that Hancock was considered, but Winfield wrote to his wife that he would have refused had he been offered the position. Now, the Union Army was under a new commander, and Hancock had been in command of a corps for less than a month as this grand campaign was being launched. Meade threw himself into making the best of it. After meeting with Meade, Hancock commented that the commander seemed nervous, but unlike other commanders, he was not afraid of Lee. One notable incident of the campaign related to Hancock was that when the 2nd Corps arrived at Uniontown, Maryland, the locals informed him that Jeb Stuart's cavalry were occupying Westminster just four miles away. Hancock sent word to Meade about the possibility of possibly capturing such an illustrious prize but Union Cavalry Commander Alfred Pleasanton assured Meade that two Union brigades of cavalry were at Westminster and the locals must have been mistaken. In reality, there were no Federal cavalry in the town. It was indeed Jeb Stuart. But since Pleasanton convinced Meade it wasn't, Hancock did not act on the information. Another significant moment happened for Hancock on the campaign. General French, one of his division commanders, requested an independent command, which he received. Hancock's longtime friend, Alexander Hayes, was then given command of French's division. By the very end of June, Union Corps were converging near the town of Gettysburg on a crash course with elements of A.P. Hill's Confederate Corps. On July 1st, they collided, and Confederate reinforcements began outflanking the Union troops. Word got to me that an engagement was underway, and that Reynolds had either been seriously wounded or killed. Either way, there needed to be an overall commander on the field. Meade quickly met with Hancock and told him to ride ahead, leaving his corps in the command of General Gibbon and take command of all the corps at Gettysburg. Winfield pointed out that Oliver Otis Howard, the commander of the 11th Corps, outranked him, but Meade assured him that all necessary steps were taken and that he was to take control of the situation. If he could find good ground in that vicinity, take it, but if not, he was to retreat to Pipe Creek to form a defensive line that Meade had mapped out. Off Hancock Road, but for about three miles, he opted to ride in an ambulance, not for any medical reason, but he needed to study the maps of the area in preparation for a taking command. Once he had familiarized himself with the terrain, he again mounted his horse and rode hard for Gettysburg. He arrived at 3.30 p.m. on Cemetery Hill, the location of Howard's Reserve and one of the only places still under firm Union control. Although the next event has many versions, most with only slight differences, most historians agree with the following account. When he informed Howard, his senior, that he had been placed in command and had written orders to prove it, Howard allegedly made a small fuss about military protocol, but nevertheless, 
Hancock quickly began issuing orders regardless of what the other corps commanders thought. It was Hancock who ordered James Wadsworth's division to secure Culp's Hill, seeing it as militarily significant. He also sent Geary's division from the 12th Corps to secure the Union left near two round hills to the south. Next, Hancock sent his aide, Major William G. Mitchell, with information to give to Meade. He informed the Army commander that he possessed a strong position and would hold out until nightfall to see if Meade wanted to bring up the whole army. Meade simply stated, I will send up the troops. At 6 p.m., with the lines for the most part stabilized, Hancock found General Slocum and turned over command to him. Then Winfield rode to Tawnytown to report to General Meade in person. After their meeting, Hancock exhausted after a long day, stretched out and got a few hours of sleep, but was awake at midnight, riding to rejoin the 2nd Corps just outside of Gettysburg. One of the most common discussions about the Battle of Gettysburg revolves around a what-if question. What if the Confederates had pushed on and taken Cemetery Hill? And in an 1878 letter to Fitzhugh Lee, Hancock answers that very question. He stated, I do not think the Confederate force then present could have carried it out. He made that statement because he saw the confusion within the Confederate ranks when they pushed into the town. That is one problem with a victorious assault. Afterward, the battle lines are very confused and malformed. Hancock believed that by the time all the Confederate officers reformed their lines, rounded up all the prisoners, and resupplied the ranks, he had the Union position secure. On the night of July 1st, the 2nd Corps camped in between the Tawny Town Road and Big Round Top, just in case Lee decided to shift southwest and turn the Union line. The next day, Hancock placed his corps on Cemetery Ridge, with Hayes near Ziegler's Grove, Gibbon's division in the center, and Caldwell on the left. To the left of Hancock's Second Corps was the Third Corps under Daniel Sickles. On July 2nd, Sickles made a horrible mistake. By thinking his position untenable, he moved out his divisions to occupy a position further west along the Emmitsburg Road, disconnecting from the Second Corps to his right and not anchoring his left flank. Hancock watched in amazement as he saw Sickles' men marching without orders. By the time Meade found out about the movement, it was too late to pull back safely because Confederate General James Longstreet's Corps was launching a massive assault against the exposed 3rd Corps. The next hours saw the 5th Corps under Sykes attempt to shore up the position around Little Round Top, the Wheat Field, and Devil's Den. However, the advance by Sickles exposed Hancock's left flank Thus, Winfield had to send Caldwell's division to the aid of Sykes and Sickles. The Third Corps' mistake would cost Hancock's corps dearly. Caldwell's 1st Brigade under Colonel Edward E. Cross headed toward Devil's Den to drive out the rebels. The Irish Brigade, after receiving the general absolution from Father William Corby, moved into the woods just south of the wheat field. Next, Zook's Brigade made its way into the Carnage Field area. Caldwell even sent in his reserve under Colonel John R. Brooke, but on his right, the Union forces were given way from attacks by Kershaw's South Carolinians and Barksdale's Mississippians. So, Caldwell had to pull back his division. Three of his four brigade commanders were casualties. Zook and Cross were both mortally wounded, and Brooke was severely wounded. When Sickles was wounded, losing a leg, Meade placed Hancock in charge of the 3rd Corps as well. Winfield rode to the left of his line, bringing Willard's brigade from Hayes' division. Barksdale's Mississippians were on their way to Cemetery Ridge. Hancock placed Willard's men in their way, but to his right he saw what he thought was Union infantry, but a volley from their ranks that wounded his aide signaled to him that it was the enemy. Hancock quickly looked about and saw a 300-man regiment coming up from the rear. He rode over to them and said, Do you see those colors? Take them. The regiment was the 1st Minnesota, who charged into Wilcox's brigade of Confederates. They paid a frightful cost, but they had halted the rebel advance. Further to the right, Ambrose Wright's Georgians pressed Hancock's men at the stone wall along Cemetery Ridge, but the Southerners were thrown back, but not after gaining much ground. Abner Doubleday said of Hancock that day, he was indefatigable, and his vigilance and personal supervision, patching the line wherever the enemy was likely to break through. His activity and foresight probably preserved the ridge from capture. Even as nightfall began to cover the battlefield, Hancock's exploits were not complete, on the far end of his line at Cemetery Hill, he heard the roaring sound of battle and dispatched Carroll's brigade of Hayes' division to offer any assistance he could to Oliver Ellis Howard's position. They arrived just in time to send back the rebels from the ground they had gained in the bloody fight. He also sent two regiments to Culp's Hill to repel the evening assaults against that position. 
That night, Meade summoned all of his corps commanders to meet at his headquarters. In a room about 10 feet square, they discussed what happened that day and what to do next. It was agreed that the position they held at that moment was a strong one, and to stay put. They also agreed that they should wait on Lee to make the next move, but there was some debate on how long they should wait. However, with no clear decision about the wait time, Meade left it up to his own discretion, and the council broke up. Generals Hancock, John Gibbon, and John Newton then found a second corps ambulance, crawled in, and went to sleep. Hancock was up early getting his troops ready. Meade concluded earlier that Lee would strike the center of his line where Hancock's men were located, but by 9 a.m. Meade met with Hancock and had changed his opinion. He now believed that an attack would come on the left again. An associate of Gibbon captured a tough old rooster and with the help of some taters, turned it into a stew. As Gibbon and Hancock sat on some old stools delighting in the welcome new food variety, Meade and a staff member, General Newton and General Pleasanton, happened by and they all got a portion of the meal. After the meal, the officers sat under a tree passing the day pretty lazily, talking about the battle the day before. After about an hour, Pleasanton, Newton, and Meade left. Hancock could see the rebels on Seminary Ridge placing their artillery in preparation for something. When the gigantic artillery barrage let loose from the rebel guns, the men of the 2nd Corps hugged the ground, and 77 pieces of Union artillery began firing back. The guns fired for nearly two hours, and the artillerymen began to slacken their fire or stop altogether to conserve ammunition. Hancock became concerned for his infantry because he knew that in the event of an artillery barrage, the best morale boost for infantry is to have their own artillery firing back. So Winfield ordered all of his 2nd Corps artillery to keep letting loose volleys. He even ordered gun crews not under his command to continue, but Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery refused the orders for his crews. He stated that Hancock had no authority to give him such an order. The two battled with profane language, but Hancock could not convince the man to do as he ordered. Hancock was on the left of his line when Pickett's charge began. He commented in his after-action report how well the battle lines were dressed as they moved across the field. His artillery had used up all their long-range ammunition and thus waited for the enemy to get closer to use their canister. Hayes on the right broke up the brigades of Brock and Braun Davis. Generals Lewis Armistead and Richard Garnett, who had attended the party with Hancock right before they left for war, had been very good friends with him, and they were in Pickett's division, barreling toward the copse of trees, the focal point of the Confederate advance. Garnett would be killed, and Armistead would be severely wounded and die a few days later, but as he lay wounded on the ground, Captain Henry Bingham told Armistead that he was a member of Hancock's staff, and he would make sure any of his effects were taken care of. Armistead told Bingham, Say to General Hancock for me that I have done him and you all a grievous injury which I shall always regret. After shoring up the breakthrough that Armistead and his men swarmed into, Hancock moved over to the left, finding the 13th Vermont there. He ordered them to turn and perform a flanking maneuver against the Confederate right. About that time, Hancock was wounded in the groin. The men from Vermont helped him off his horse and laid him on the ground, but he refused to be moved until the battle was over, so he propped himself up on one elbow and watched over the battle. The commander of the 16th Vermont and Hancock's friend passed by, and Winfield said to him, Go in, Colonel, and give it to them on the flank. The Vermonters did as they were told and broke up what was left of the Confederate assault. Only after the hostilities had ended did Hancock allow for the Corps surgeon to examine him. Hancock and Armistead had come a long way from Los Angeles, wounded just a few hundred yards apart, fighting one another. In true Hancock military fashion, he took his responsibility as an officer seriously. So when he was loaded into an ambulance and the wagon took off, he quickly ordered it to stop so he could dictate to the surgeon a letter to be given to General Meade. I have never seen a more formidable attack, and if the 6th and 5th Corps have pressed up, the enemy will be destroyed. The enemy must be short of ammunition, as I was shot with a ten-penny nail. I did not leave the field till the victory was entirely secured, and the enemy no longer in sight. I am badly wounded, but I trust not seriously. I had to break the line to attack the enemy in flank on my right, where the enemy was most persistent after their front attack was propelled. Not a rebel was in sight upright when I left. The line should be immediately restored and perfected. General Caldwell is in command of the Corps, and I have directed him to restore the line. The ten-penny nail that he mentioned in his address to Meade had actually came from his saddle, 
along with some wood into the wound. The surgeon was able to probe with his finger and extract the tenpenny nail and stop the blood, but it was a serious wound so close to a main artery. When he made it to the hospital for the Corps, his men crowded around him and gave shouts of acclamation. He attempted to address the crowd, but weak from blood loss, he fainted into his comrades' arms. Any time the Army of the Potomac was in action, Hancock would wire his wife a message letting her know he was safe. He had wired her that morning saying he was all right so far. Without including too much information, he informed her that he had been wounded and to meet him in Philadelphia where he was to recover. The Army surgeon had been able to extract the tin penny nail and the wood that entered the wound with the bullet, but had been unable to recover the lead projectile. The day after his wounding, he rode in an ambulance over bumpy roads in excruciating pain to a railhead, then on to Philadelphia. There he was under the care of a gunshot specialist, Dr. D. H. Agnew, and after numerous attempts at probing the wound trying to find the bullet, the doctor could not find the projectile. Over the next couple of weeks, the wound continued to drain and not heal. The horrible heat made Hancock stay in Philadelphia miserable, and thus it was decided to move him to Norristown, hoping that it might be cooler a little further north. When he arrived by rail to Norristown, a detail from the Invalid Corps carried his stretcher from the Norristown station to his parents' home on Swede Street. In agony and not getting any better, Winfield still insisted on taking care of military matters. He wired Meade and recommended that Governor Warren take temporary command of the 2nd Corps while he was unable to perform that duty. Meade was favoring Warren too and he was placed in temporary command of Hancock's troops. By the end of July, the situation was looking worse for Hancock. He wasn't getting any better, and the bullet was still lodged in his thigh next to the groin. Dr. Lewis W. Reed, a native of Norristown, Pennsylvania, was in charge of the Army Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, but he was on leave in his hometown when Hancock was there recovering. He paid the general a visit. The doctor was shocked to find Hancock looking pale and emaciated and talking of death. The general said he had been probed and tortured so much that death would be a relief. As Reed arose from the bedside, Hancock said, Goodbye, Doctor. I may never see you again. Reed had made his way to the door when Hancock had another thought. See here, Doctor. Why don't you try to get this ball out? I have had all the reputation in the country at it. Now let's have some of the practical. Reed noted that Hancock was lying in bed with his right leg flexed. All the probing had been done with his leg bent at right angles. Yet he had been hit while in the saddle with his legs extended. The doctor felt that he could find the ball if he could get Hancock's leg into the same position it had been in when he was shot. With an aid, he managed to straighten the limb and had Hancock straddle a chair placed on top of the dining room table. From across the room, Reed sighted the probable trajectory of the bullet and then inserted the probe into the wound at the angle so sighted. The probe, Reed said, dropped fully eight inches into the channel and struck the ball, which was embedded in the sharp bone which you sit upon. He was then able to extract the large mini ball. Once it was removed, Hancock's recovery truly began. After only a week, he was up on his feet using crutches. By mid-September, he left Norristown and visited New York City and West Point. Then he traveled to St. Louis to spend time at his wife's family's home, where he and Almira and the children stayed for six weeks. He stopped using the crutches at that time and began using a cane to support himself. However, since Winfield was not constantly on the move like he had been most of his life, the stationary lifestyle while recovering resulted in a considerable amount of weight gain. A soldier who cast their eyes on him the next year stated, If, as has been asserted, all flesh is grass, General Hancock may be said to be a load of hay. He actually would never lose the weight that he gained while convalescing. During the fall and into December of 1863, Hancock read letters from his friends in the Army and newspapers describing the military situation as it pertained to the Army of the Potomac. Meade had done a lot of maneuvering against Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia, but pressure was on him from Washington to defeat Lee. After the aborted Mine Run campaign, rumors swirled that Meade would be replaced and Hancock's name came up in the conversations. Winfield and Meade had a deep conversation through a series of letters about the situation. Hancock told his Army commander that, I am no aspirant, and I never could be a conspirator had I other feelings toward you than I possess. I would sooner command a corps under you than have the supreme command. I have faith in you. I have always served faithfully, and so intend to do. I would always prefer a good man to command that army 
than to command it myself. If I ever command it, it will be given to me as it was to you. I shall never express or imply a desire to command, for I do not feel it. On December 29th, he took back command of the 2nd Corps, but found he was unable to perform all of his duties and thus requested a commission to examine his absence. They looked over his leave and found him still not fit for duty, and he was sent back north on January 8, 1864. Hancock spent from January to March traveling through the major northern cities, as requested by the War Department, to boost recruitment by making speeches and inspiring men with his presence to join the army. But war weariness was plaguing the North. He was also engaged in a war of letters with all of Rhodes Howard. Congress had issued a joint resolution of thanks to Meade, Howard, and Hooker for the victory at Gettysburg, leaving out Hancock's name. The Army and Navy Journal published a correction for the resolution by telling about Howard's shortcomings and the accomplishments of Hancock. Howard wrote to Winfield to see if he had been behind the article, and the 2nd Corps commander set him straight that he had done nothing of the sort. Hancock also defended Meade in the inquiry against the Army commander for his actions at Gettysburg. Hancock's reputation and statements helped save Meade's position. At the end of March, Hancock was well enough to rejoin the 2nd Corps, However, it looked very different. Meade had reorganized the army, doing away with some corps and merging their units into the existing ones. The second corps also got a new division commander, Francis Channing Barlow, formerly attached to the 11th Corps. Severely wounded at Gettysburg, captured, and then exchanged, he was known as a tough fighter, and Hancock wanted him a part of his corps. The army also had another addition, the presence of Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant. The commander of all Union forces gave Meade a directive. Lee's army will be your objective point. Wherever Lee goes, there you will go also. With that, the Army of the Potomac and Hancock began the Overland Campaign in early May. In early May, Grant moved the Army of the Potomac across the Rapidan River, attempting to get on Lee's flank and maybe even separate the Confederate general from the Confederate capital, Richmond. It was a decisive move on Grant's part, and Hancock was a vital part of that movement, moving his large Second Corps across the river at Ely's Ford, and from there he moved to the old Chancellorsville battlefield, where he was to bivouac for the night on May 4th. It was an eerie place for Hancock's troops, who found the bones of Union and Confederate troops unburied from the year before. Hancock's wound had not fully healed. He was still in great pain when he rode a horse, so he rode in an ambulance when his army moved, but he informed his wife that when an engagement erupted, he had to mount his horse and fight through the excruciating pain of riding. The Corps then moved west. This caught Lee off guard, and the rebel commander quickly set his army into motion to engage the Union Army in the thick underbrush of the wilderness, where their numbers would mean less. In general, Hancock moved his troops with great quickness, one of the fastest commanders in either army. So when the Fifth Corps and the Sixth Corps were attacked on the turnpike, Winfield's men were nearly two miles beyond where Meade envisioned him of being. Therefore, when Meade ordered Hancock back to Todd's Tavern, he had to reverse course. Learning that Confederates could use the intersection of the Orange Plank Road and the Brock Road as a way to cut the Union Army in two, Grant and Meade ordered Hancock to continue up the Brock Road and then take the Orange Plank Road to secure the Union left flank. It would be along this road that Hancock would come into contact with General A.P. Hill's Corps. The wilderness produced a chaotic situation for both armies, and when units did move, the formations were broken up by the dense undergrowth. Hancock did his best to follow the series of orders streaming to him from Meade's headquarters. The couriers arrived late with his orders to support General Getty in his attack. Despite being late, Hancock got his corps moving as quickly as he could. It was around this time that one of the couriers described the Second Corps commander's stoic nature in battle when he witnessed Hancock sitting astride his horse and observing his close friend and division commander, Alexander Hayes' body, being brought back on a stretcher. Hancock didn't flinch, but sat stoically as his friend passed by, even though he was deeply affected by the loss. The fighting died down as darkness covered the field, and both armies began to dig in where they stopped. The morning of May 6th opened with Hancock's corps attacking the battered brigades of A.P. Hill's corps at 5 a.m., the Confederates were taken off guard and began falling back quickly. The Union troops began to suffer from their success. The wilderness had confused the ranks of his soldiers, and officers lost contact with some of their men. But they were nevertheless pushing west. Hancock was ecstatic. One of Meade's couriers made it to the Corps commander, and he replied, We are driving them, sir. 
Tell General Meade we are driving them most beautifully. Bernie has gone in and is just cleaning them out beautifully. However, that courier had some unfortunate news to give Hancock. Burnside and his corps, which was supposed to form on his right and attack with him, had failed to do so. Thus, his flank was unsupported. When Longstreet and his corps arrived at the last minute on the field, this brought Hancock's attack to a halt. His men pulled back to some defenses, but the Confederates were on the move. And so was a fire, created by flashes from rifle and cannon muzzles. At one point, the breastworks protected Mott's division, caught on fire and the Federals pulled back. This allowed for the Confederate troops to charge through the fire and create a break in Hancock's line. Despite the breakthrough, Hancock and all of his division commanders worked tirelessly to regain the breastworks. On May 7th, the two sides fired shots at one another, but no major fighting occurred. That night, Warren's 5th Corps was ordered to do a night march. The 2nd Corps watched with concern as their comrades marched behind them. Concern because if they turned east to take the plank road, that meant they were retreating and the fighting had been all in vain. But when the 5th Corps continued their march south along the Brock Road, Hancock's men cheered so loudly that the Confederates thought there was an attack and began firing their rifles into the Federal breastworks. This lifted up the spirits of the entire Union Army. The 2nd Corps moved out as well, this time south. There would be no retreating now. It was on to Richmond. However, a traffic jam did emerge along the road toward Spotsylvania Courthouse. This contributed to Lee being able to set up defenses before Grant got there. At first, Hancock was ordered to assail the Confederate left to the west, but got recalled at the last minute to come and attack the Confederate center near a place termed the Mule Shoe because of the way the Confederates were entrenched in a semicircle. On the morning of May 12th and delayed 35 minutes until 4.35 a.m. because of fog, Hancock ordered one of the grandest assaults of the Civil War. Generals Barlow and Burney's division were in front with Mott and Gibbon's divisions in the rear. Lee made a critical mistake. 30 pieces of artillery guarded the mule chute, but he was concerned of a movement made to the east and pulled out 22 of the 30 guns. At the last second, they reversed course and reoccupied the mule chute, but just as they set up, Hancock's men burst forth through the woods and scaled the entrenchments, erupting in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The Federals chased off the Confederates and captured multiple pieces of artillery and two Confederate generals, Edward Johnson and George Maryland Stewart. Johnson had known Hancock for a long time, and when the two prisoners made it to Winfield, Edward, with tears in his eyes, threw his arms around Hancock and embraced him and said, This is bad luck, yet I would rather have had this good fortune to fall to you than to any other man living. The encounter with Stuart was vastly different. Hancock, while in Washington, D.C., had met Stuart's wife, and he wanted to give the Confederate general news of her. Hancock asked, How are you, Stuart? and extended his hand. George said, I am General Stewart of the Confederate Army, and under present circumstances, I decline to take your hand. Hancock replied, And under any other circumstances, General Stewart, I should not have offered it. You should not have put an affront upon me in the presence of my officers and soldiers. From 6 a.m. until after midnight, the two armies experienced one of the most brutal episodes of bloodletting during the war. The two sides fought at many times within arm's length of one another, sending bayonets into the enemy through the holes in the breastworks and firing on each other at point-blank range. The cold rain kept up all day and the bodies of the dead and wounded were trampled down into the mud and the blood. Trees were cut down by the incessant musketry and still the survivors battled on. Eventually, Lee pulled his troops back to a defensive line a couple of hundred yards behind the mule chute. Looking over the fought-over ground, Nelson Miles wrote, It looks like a slaughter pen and is a sight to make anyone sick of war. It was the only ground that I ever saw during the war that was so completely covered with dead and wounded that it was impossible to walk over it without stepping on dead bodies. Ulysses S. Grant chose the Second Corps to play a pivotal role in the next phase of the Overland Campaign. On May 21st, Hancock moved his corps east and south, separating himself more and more from the main body. This was all in Grant's plan. He wanted to draw General Lee away from his position around Spotsylvania Courthouse by offering him what the Confederate commander loved best, defeating the enemy in detail. Lee had done this multiple times, singling out a Union force and defeating them before the whole army could concentrate, and Grant hoped he would take the bait by going after Hancock's corps. 
It was at this entrenched area that some brand new recruits attached to the 2nd Corps dug in as they were told, but quickly came under Confederate artillery fire. An officer from the unit rode to Hancock and complained, General, our breastwork is only bulletproof, and the rebels are shelling us. Hancock calmly asked, Killed anybody? The inexperienced officer stated, Not yet, sir. Well, Hancock said, you can tell them to take it comfortably. The rebels often throw shells, and I am sure I cannot prevent them. Grant had great confidence in Hancock, and that is the reason he chose the Pennsylvanian for the task. He knew that the 2nd Corps could hold their own against the Army of Northern Virginia until Grant could take Lee by surprise. However, Lee was too smart for that. Instead of going after Hancock, Lee moved quickly to place himself in between Grant and Richmond. Frustrated at the fact that Lee had not taken the bait, Grant moved the Army of the Potomac, still persistent east and south toward the capital. The two armies would meet at a place called Cold Harbor. The Confederates entrenched themselves in a nearly impregnable position. Hancock was on the far left of the Union line. Orders came down from Meade that three corps were to attack the Confederate position at 4.30 a.m. on June 3rd. Barlow and Gibbon's divisions were in the front line for the Second Corps, with Bernie in reserve. The division slammed into the Confederate line. Gibbon's division could not make any headway and suffered dearly in front of the rebel guns. Barlow, on the other hand, did capture the enemy works, but could not hold on to it. As one soldier explained, they died in heaps. They got pushed back stubbornly, but only fell back about 40 yards to a small rise, where the men dug in with their hands and bayonets to make the position secure and fired into the Confederates from that short distance. After the immense bloodshed, the attacks were called off and the Union troops settled into their entrenchments. Hancock kept his headquarters extremely close to the front lines and while standing in the doorway of Winfield's tent, the assistant provost marshal, Captain Alexander McCune, was killed by a cannonball. The second corps commander was saddened by the loss and moved his headquarters the next day. His adjutant explained, however he might choose to deal with his own life, he recognized his responsibility for the lives of the young men he had called around him. Grant then pulled his army out of their fortifications and moved south. For a few days, Lee was baffled. He had no clear idea where Grant was or where he was going. But the Army of the Potomac was targeting Petersburg, Virginia, a vital railroad hub and the location where Lee got much of his supplies and communications from the rest of the South. What happened next was a series of miscommunications that led to the Union failing to achieve an important objective. Hancock's 2nd Corps and Baldy Smith's 18th Corps recently detached from the Army of the James was to attack the weak defenses of Petersburg on June 15th. At least that was what Grant conveyed to Smith. However, that information was not given to Hancock. Winfield knew he was destined for Petersburg, but had no knowledge of an attack. On the night of the 14th, Meade sent word to Hancock to wait for the boats with rations to make it to his position. Hancock communicated to Meade that he did not need rations at the moment and could be in motion much earlier, but Meade insisted on the rations. Hancock waited from 3.30 a.m. to about 9 a.m. for the boats, but they never arrived. So he put his corps in motion at about 10.30 a.m. for Petersburg. The map that Meade gave to Hancock's aide was faulty, so it took Hancock until around 6.30 p.m. to get within a mile of Smith's forces. Smith, on the other hand, because of his extreme caution, had let a vital opportunity pass him by. He had well over 15,000 men at his disposal but without the 2nd Corps' help, and was in position to attack the entrenchments around Petersburg by 1.30 p.m. However, he delayed attacking until 7 o'clock. The enemy opposing him was commanded by PGT Beauregard and it consisted of about 2,800 men, mostly militia and citizens, prepared to protect the town. When Smith did attack, he captured part of the entrenchments and did not pursue any further. The Confederate forces were gone, and Petersburg stood ripe for the taking. By the time Hancock made it to the field, he did not know the situation, so he turned over the use of two of his divisions to Smith, but no further attacks were made, and Petersburg remained uncaptured. Smith badmouthed Hancock and most of the Union High Command in the press, and when an investigation was suggested to find out why the 2nd Corps commander had not arrived sooner or with more speed, Grant waved it off and said, The reputation of the 2nd Corps and its commander is so high, both with the public and in the Army, that an investigation could not add to it. That reputation cannot be tarnished by newspaper articles or scribblers.
Hancock was mad at himself the next day when he found out that virtually no Confederates occupied the town the night before after the initial attacks. He was irritable and the incessant pain from his wound did not help. An officer found him at one point sitting on the ground pouring water into the still open wound, trying to get some relief. June 16th opened with 14,000 Confederates guarding Petersburg, and for the next couple of days, the Union Army attacked the fortifications, unable to dislodge them. It had been a month and a half since the campaign started, and the 2nd Corps and the entire Army of the Potomac was war completely out. Barlow relayed to Hancock, that there were hardly any officers in his division because they had either been killed or wounded over the past month since the campaign began. On June 17th, Hancock reported to me that he could hardly walk or ride. The splintered bone from his wounding was working their way to the skin, and he laid in agony for 10 days, giving temporary command to General Burney. On June 22nd, the 2nd Corps met a disastrous fate as they attempted a flanking maneuver, but ultimately got flanked by men from A.P. Hill's Corps. The outrage from this disaster brought Hancock back into the field on June 27th, but what was to follow was the monotonous life of siege warfare as the Union position became stronger by the day so that more troops could be allocated to attack Lee's flanks. The stationary lifestyle would ultimately help Hancock as he still suffered from his wounding. The monotony of siege warfare not only impacted the rank and file soldiers but also the general officers. When he was not in the field supervising drill or inspecting fortifications, he was lounging at his headquarters attempting to heal. One of General Meade's staff officers described the scene. Hancock lay at full length in a covered wagon attired in a white shirt and blue flannel pantaloons, quite enough for the intensely hot day. He lies down as much as he can to give his wounded leg rest. On a regular basis, Meade would come to visit, sit down on the front seat of the wagon, light a cigar, and talk with Winfield. The staff officer said, we all knew he was fixed for an hour at least. When he gets down with Hancock, they talk and talk and talk, being great friends. In late June, Hancock and the 2nd Corps were to march across the James River at Deep Bottom. They did so encountering some lightly held Confederate positions and capturing four 20-pound Parrot guns. As they pressed on, Hancock came upon the well-entrenched men of Joseph Kershaw and Cadmus Wilcox. Seeing that the position was too strong to throw his troops against, he declined to attack it, but kept his eye on them. The whole time that the 2nd Corps was marching to Deep Bottom, some Pennsylvania miners were digging away at a tunnel underneath the Confederate line at Petersburg and planned to explode gunpowder and open a gap in the Rebel line. The Deep Bottom expedition was supposed to draw troops away from that sector so that when the explosion occurred, Union forces could rush in without the threat of Confederate reinforcements. It had worked. Lee had sent away three divisions to deal with Hancock at Deep Bottom, but the attack on the crater was hit with a lot of misfortunes and poor decisions and did not result in the desired hopes. The fact that the Deep Bottom Expedition worked so well to draw troops away from Petersburg made Grant desire another movement to Deep Bottom that would accomplish many objectives. Reports informed Grant that Lee was planning on reinforcing Jubal early in the valley, so a movement to Deep Bottom may convince Lee to pull back those reinforcements, or if he did decide to send aid to Early, then his lines would be weakened. It seemed a win-win situation for the Union Army. The second expedition was much more complicated. Hancock's Corps was to get on transports and to sail off as if going to Washington. But during the night, they were supposed to steam back up the James River and disembark on gangplanks to the banks of the river. Hancock inspected the area personally and did not have faith in the gangplank idea, so he ordered wharves to be built. The expedition was fraught with mistakes, when the steamers went up the river, some boats ran aground and others found that they were taking on too much water and couldn't get to the wharves. When the Corps did disembark, it was much later than anticipated, but Hancock assaulted the fortifications as directed. However, Winfield ran into another problem, green troops. His ranks were replenished by brand new recruits who had never seen battle. Many refused to attack, or if they did, they did so lackadaisically. The Irish Brigade in particular crowded under a patch of trees and refused to move. It was horribly frustrating for the Corps commander, who had been so successful with his veterans, but now could not follow orders because his troops would not do as they were told. One happy event that did happen at the same time as the 2nd Deep Bottom Expedition, Hancock was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General in the regular army. After the debacle that was the 2nd Deep Bottom Expedition, 
Grant set his sights on a vital railroad, the Weldon Railroad at Reams Station. On August 23rd, Hancock and his troops occupied the station and began destroying the railroad for about three miles to the south. The Sixth Corps, which had been at the station back in June, had built some entrenchments, so on the night of the 23rd, the Second Corps occupied them. It was in the shape of a U and was not placed in the best location to fight off an attack. On the night of the 24th, Meade sent word to Hancock that a large body of enemy troops were moving in his direction. It was troops under Hancock's old friend Harry Heath, who was leading his men in that sector because A.P. Hill was sick. On August 25th, Heath's troops opened a grand artillery volley that scared the new recruits in the Second Corps. The cannonading only lasted 15 minutes before Hancock sent in four brigades. For a few minutes, Hancock's line held, but it quickly gave way. It looked to be a total disaster for the Second Corps. Two men stand out who saved the Union that day. One was Hancock, the other was his young division commander Nelson Miles. Miles led what men he could find to repulse the rebels. Many got shot down in their attempt to retake the entrenchments. Hancock rode around the battlefield assembling groups of soldiers and leading them personally to the front lines, coming near being shot multiple times. The actions of Miles and Hancock were tireless, and they were able to keep the battle from being a total Union rout. It was getting dark and that brought the fighting to an end. Hancock brought together his three division commanders and asked, if they attacked, could they retake the position? Miles and Greg said yes, but Gibbon said no, his men were not up to the task. Knowing that the assault would be pointless if all three divisions didn't act in a coordinated effort, Hancock ordered his men to fall back, leaving the field. Heath's men pulled back at the same time, but Hancock was sorely bitter for the situation. As his chief of staff said, it was the first time he had felt the bitterness of defeat during the war. This was the first big loss in Hancock's time as a corps commander. It was usually the second corps that held itself together during most battles, win or lose, but this was different. By October, Grant wanted another movement made to the southwest, this time at Hatcher's Run. He moved part of the second corps and the ninth corps to that location. When the two Union corps were supposed to attack, the ninth corps held back and did not make their assault. Without a threat to the Confederate line, Harry Heath was able to concentrate his force against Hancock at Hatcher's Run. This time, when the two friends met on the battlefield, Hancock came out the victor. For the most part, Winfield's line held firm, and after the fight, he had to pull back because the rest of the Union forces had not supported him. Hancock had redeemed himself to himself for the debacle at Reams Station. That was the last of the major campaign and because winter was coming on. Throughout the summer and into September after the disaster of the crater, Ambrose Burnside was in a court of inquiry and Hancock presided over it. By the end, Burnside would be relieved of command. In late 1864, talk circulated around the Union Army that Meade was going to be given a separate command, possibly the army that was in the Shenandoah Valley, and it was Hancock that would become the commander of the Army of the Potomac. When Philip Sheridan took control of the Army in the Valley, instead of George Meade, the rumors of Hancock taking over the Army of the Potomac faded. However, Winfield would be taking another command, rather than remaining with his second corps. It was November 1864, and with the Union High Command not knowing exactly how long the war would last, they decided to form another corps, a veteran corps, made up of veterans who had served at least two years and were honorably discharged. They would be lured back into the army with a sign-on bonus of $500, and to make the situation more enticing, Hancock was chosen to lead it. Having a trusted commander at the helm of the corps would hopefully bring recruits streaming into its ranks. By the time December rolled around, Hancock had turned over his command of the 2nd Corps to General Humphreys and was now on the home front recruiting. He was having a hard time getting men to rejoin the ranks. Those who had survived two years in combat were not too willing to risk their lives again. Plus, depending on the locality from which these men enlisted, the sign-on bonus fluctuated, even though $400 would be coming from the federal government. Only a little over 4,400 men enlisted. On February 27, 1865, Hancock would be given command of the Department of West Virginia and the Middle Military Division, all of which encompassed Washington, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware. Its former commander, General George Crook, although a good fighter, had been captured by Confederate cavalry dressed as Union soldiers a few days before and taken to Libby Prison in Richmond, Virginia. By this point in the war, there wasn't much for Hancock to do in that department. He sent cavalry against possible guerrilla attacks, but the war was coming to an end. 
In March, Grant sent him a message telling him to assemble his troops in the Shenandoah Valley and to be ready to move at a moment's notice. When Lee ultimately gave up Richmond, Grant wanted Hancock to proceed south to cut off Lee's army, but the order never came. Lee surrendered on April 9th, and with his capitulation, the other armies did as well through the spring and summer of 1865. When the war began, Hancock remarked to a friend that he expected to come out of the conflict a major. At its end, he was a major general and one of the most respected soldiers in the United States. After Lee's surrender, Almira traveled from Baltimore to Winchester, Virginia to be with her husband, but although they hoped with the war to close to get some relief from the drudgery of military duties and spend time with each other, a catastrophe occurred. The president had been murdered, and the new president, Andrew Johnson, called on Hancock as commander of the Middle Military Division to restore order to the panic-stricken city and nation. Simply, Hancock's presence calmed down the city. Although much of the local law enforcement and military officials were already in the process of finding and rounding up participants in the murder of Lincoln and the attack on William Seward, his Secretary of State, Hancock helped to organize further manhunts. Once the conspirators were rounded up, Hancock oversaw many of the military matters related to the trial of the conspirators in the military court. At the end of June, Winfield accompanied William Seward to New York for the funeral of Seward's wife. He returned to Washington before the month was up and received the warrant of execution signed by Johnson. The date of execution was scheduled for July 7, 1865. On July 6, at noon, Hancock went to the arsenal where the prisoners were kept and delivered the warrants to the Special Provost Marshal General. He then visited each prisoner and delivered the news of their time for execution for the next day. When he informed Mary Surratt, the owner of the boarding house where the conspirators met to hatch their plan, she collapsed and said, I had no hand in the murder of the president. That night, Surratt's lawyers worked tirelessly to assemble a petition for a writ of habeas corpus to hopefully stop the execution of the woman. At 3 a.m. on July 7th, the writ was issued to Hancock to present the prisoner. When the court convened, Hancock was not present. The judge submitted that Hancock held military power over him so he could do nothing to stop it. An hour and a half after the court convened, Hancock made his appearance, having been delayed by the military matters. His statement was in line with Winfield's adherence to military protocol. He informed the judge that Mary Surratt was in his possession, but he could not deliver her to court under a writ of habeas corpus because President Johnson had suspended the writ of habeas corpus in this case. The judge allowed him to leave and he reported back to the arsenal. Hancock was off-put by the thought of hanging a woman and hoping and possibly believing that the president would issue a pardon, posted couriers at intervals from the White House to the arsenal so that any word regarding the case could be sent to him as quickly as possible with no impediments. Later, Almira wrote that her husband advocated on Mary Surratt's behalf with the president, but because his wife was writing at a time when public opinion was against Surratt's execution and Hancock was receiving a partial blame for the injustice, Almira's statements are suspect. There is no evidence that demonstrates that Hancock ever advocated for her release to the president. John W. Clampett, Mary Surratt's attorney, approached Hancock and asked if there was any hope she would be set free. Despairingly, Hancock said no. He also told Clampett, I have been in many a battle and have seen death and mixed with it in disaster and in victory. I've been in a living hell of fire and shell and grape shot, and I'd sooner be there 10,000 times over than to give the order this day for the execution of that poor woman. But I am a soldier, sworn to obey, and obey I must. At 1.25 p.m. on July 7th, the four conspirators were hanged. Ten minutes later, the coroner pronounced them dead, but although Mary Surratt's time on this earth was over, her death and the events leading up to it would come back to haunt Hancock.